the Balfour Declaration, written by Arthur Balfour, who was the leader of the Cecil Block after Lord Salisbury. Remember when I told you a guy took over, but he sucked and he didn't really like have a strong leadership role and then the Milner group just took over? The, it, it was this guy. This is Arthur Balfour. November 2nd, 1917, he wrote a letter to Lord Rothschild stating that there should be a national home for Jews in Palestine. But record scratch, this guy actually did not write it. He wrote these like childish scribbles as a signature, but he did not write this. The true person who wrote this was Milner and it should be called the Milner Declaration. This fact was not made public until 1937. At that time, Ors Migor, another member of the Milner Group, speaking for the government in common said, the draft as originally put up by Lord Balfour was not the final draft approved by the War Cabinet. The particular draft assented to the War Cabinet and s signed by allies and the United States and finally embodied in the mandate happens to have been drafted by Lord Milner. The actual final draft had to be issued in the name of the Foreign Secretary, but the actual draftsman was Lord Milner. Let's get an idea of how the British thought of this region of the world. So at this time in uh, World War I, Turkey did not exist, Syria didn't exist, Iraq didn't exist. This was the Ottoman Empire including Israel, Ottoman Empire. And after World War I, when they were redrawing uh, the states, France and Britain were deciding what territory they would take over. Let's get an idea of how they thought about this region of the world. So John Dove, uh, in a letter to Brand, so two members of the Milner Group, asked why there was so much pro-Arab feeling among the British, especially the public school caste. And he attributed it to the Arabs' good manners derived from desert life and their love of sports, especially riding and shooting. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry, I have to change this. I don't like seeing Israel there, so I'm just gonna cover that up. <laughs> Dove declared that the whole Arab world should be in one state and it must have Syria and Palestine for its front door. The Arab world, he explained, needs this western door because we are trying to westernize the Arabs. So remember, the British Empire had India over here. Just off screen, India. If they got control of Palestine here, and they also had control of Egypt, if they got Palestine, they considered it, it was like a front door towards the rest of their dominion, you know? And they wanted to westernize the Arabs, like turn them British. They did not want a Jewish state. League of Nations, mandate for Palestine. So I know this is contradictory. I will get into it, don't worry. So behind the scenes, they were pro-Arab and they were you know, they had no intentions, they didn't want to turn into a Jewish state. However, as you know, Milner wrote the goddamn Balfour Declaration. So what, what the hell happened? League of Nations, mandate for Palestine. Once the mandate was set up, also in terms drafted by Milner, the group took little part in the administration of Palestine. None of the high commissioners were members and none of the various commissions concerned possessed a member of the Milner Group until the Peel Commission of 1936, which had Reginald Copeland, who was part of the Milner Group, but I'm not gonna get into that. And then after Israel started settling in Palestine, uh, there were revolts, and here's the aftermath of one of the revolts that happened from Palestinians and yeah, uh, and as we know, like, their oppression has gotten worse and worse over time. And now they live in an open air prison, which is Gaza, and their water is controlled by Zionists, and it's just a terrible situation. 
but this is important. If you don't know how, if you don't know how Israel got set up, this is going to tell you everything you need to know. The voice of David Ben-Gurion declaring the establishment of the State of Israel in May 1948. The Balfour Declaration was a letter sent by British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to a member of the British House of Lords, Lord Rothschild, on the 2nd of November, 1917. This letter, sent to a leading figure in the British Jewish community a hundred years ago, had repercussions which even its authors cannot have imagined. Whatever its real intentions, it went on to have a profound impact on the Middle East and its people. And its effects still resonate across the region today. In 1914, these soldiers were fighting on the battlefields of Europe in the First World War. The Allies, Britain, France, and Russia fought the Central Powers of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire for four years. But the land and sea war was not the only battleground. Muscle was also being flexed behind closed doors as allies conspired how to redraw maps to their own advantage when the conflict eventually ceased. Sir Mark Sykes for the British and Francois-Georges Picot for the French plotted how to divide the Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire, assuming it would finally fall. The Sykes-Picot agreement planned secretly to divide it into French and British spheres of influence. France taking most of the Levant, southern Anatolia and the Mosul area, while the British extended their control over the southern... So you'll notice uh, some of these names, right? Damascus, Syria, right? Baghdad, Iraq. Southern Levant, expanding eastwards to Baghdad and Basra, and all the land between the Arabian Gulf and the French territory. Historic Palestine, then still part of the Ottoman Empire, was a bone of contention and would be put under international administration. La Palestine, Français, Anglais et Russes n'arrivent pas à s'accorder parce que tout le monde veut avoir la Palestine. Pourquoi Parce que d'une part la Palestine, la France a de très riches souvenirs en Palestine et l'Angleterre, elle, c'est surtout la position de la Palestine qui l'intéresse. Parce... Yeah. So the French wanted it for historical reasons. The British wanted Palestine, like I said, as a front door for the Arab world, and also because it was close to the Suez Canal, the gateway to the Indian, Indian Empire, which they owned. The Canal de Suez, the Canal de Suez, is the road that leads to the Empire of the Indes. We decide to create a regime international to internationalize the Palestine. Yeah. They couldn't decide, so it became an international place. They didn't say if it was French or British. Theodore Herzl had founded the Zionist movement in the late 19th century. But Jewish people in Western Europe had not rushed to support it because they were integrating quite successfully into society. Zion yeah, so here's a big thing. Zionism, all of a sudden it started by this guy and meanwhile, Jewish people in Europe were kind of merging into wherever they were. If they were in Britain, they were merging into, you know, British society. 
And then the Zionist movement came up where they thought like, no, all Jews must go back to historic Palestine. The Zionist movement was not in line with what Jews of the time wanted. Zionists believed that all Jews should someday return to that country. One of the problems was that Palestine belonged to the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire um, was not clear that it wanted massive Jewish immigration into Palestine. And the British government offered to let Jews move unimpeded in great numbers into Uganda if they wished. Um, but in any event, it really didn't happen. And it didn't happen because a majority of Zionists felt yeah. that Herzl was selling them out. And Herzl. that the only place for Jews to move back to, or at least conscious Zionist Jews to move back to, was Palestine. In this, I think, Britain began to look on the Zionist movement as a possible partner in justifying a renegotiations of their agreement with the French. You see, for Britain simply to claim territory against what they'd already concluded in an agreement with France could create diplomatic problems for the British. But if they were to make a claim to Palestine, not out of self-interest, but in order to advance a great historic ideal of the restoration of the Jewish people to their biblical homeland, that this could justify an adjustment of the terms of Sykes-Picot in a way that the French would accept. And the British got an idea. Oh, there's the Zionist movement that says they own this place. Okay, well now we can say, oh, us British, we don't want Palestine because we, you know, we don't want it for geopolitical reasons. We want it because these people deserve their rightful. See where I'm going with this? Like they they tried to use that as a justification to make it solely a British. The state. British wanted somehow, uh, and, and and more and more increasingly, they felt that the Jews held the key to winning the war, um, and so. And that's another huge thing. They were struggling with World War I. World War I was not a, you know, piece of cake, right? They didn't know. They were plotting all this, assuming they would win, but they were still worried that they would not win the war. And yeah, they thought another reason, if we support Jews taking over Palestine, then the British could recruit more Jews into the war and they thought that was a key thing that needed to happen in order for them to win they had to figure out how to bribe the jews to support them and herbert samuel's ideas about the rights of the jews to resettle in palestine did not find much sympathy in the corridors of power in london a disappointed weizmann wrote to a friend asking whether there wasn't at least a discussion to be had about what he called the chance for the Jewish people. I realize, of course, he went on, we cannot claim anything. We are much too atomized for it. What the debate did do, however, was to throw together Weizmann, the Russian Jewish immigrant searching for a homeland and refuge from persecution, with Herbert Samuel and Lord Rothschild, for members of the British Jewish elite. God is damn it. They said Rothschild. Now my stream is going to get demonetized. God damn it. Published in society and part of the political and capitalist class. Zionism, for the most part, across all of the community, was actually in the minority. <laughs> but the certainly Alex most Jones of all <laughs> within the Jewish elite because it threatened the notion of them as 100% committed members of British society. And this was complete anathema for somebody like Edwin Montagu, who becomes Secretary of State for India. So here's a, here's a, a big thing. Rothschild was not a Zionist. For him, Zionism is his worst nightmare. The idea that Jews and not satisfied simply with being citizens of Britain or other countries around the world, but always longing to go back to the land of Israel. For him, he wanted to demonstrate that the Jews of Britain were first and foremost British. 
So then the Zionist movement have these meetings and they're still talking with France. And now... But his idea was rejected. They didn't want an Anglo-French condominium in Palestine. They wanted the British uh, to protect them, not the French. And that's because they thought that the French always sort of converted their colonized people into becoming Frenchmen. Okay, one, one thing. Uh, one thing I skipped over that's like the crucial part of the story. This Zionist group was successful in tricking people into thinking all Jewish people wanted to move back to historic Palestine. Okay? To the point where British leaders were thinking this was just like common, like if you're a Jew, you want to move back to Palestine and they needed Jewish support to win the war. So it's like they kind of bought into the propaganda. The Zionists won. They won their marketing campaign of tricking normal folks into thinking Jews wanted that when they didn't. And they even tricked the British elites into into thinking that as well. And what they wanted was to remain as self-conscious Jews. And they thought that the British uh, would leave them alone and let them do that. And so look at how much power the Zionist group is making the shots now. OK, so France and England said. Palestine's international. And then the Zionists convince everyone that, you know, it's the home of the Jews and then they have the power. OK. Now they're the ones deciding who gets to own the territory, right? The Zionists had those meetings where they were like, we don't want French involvement because in the past they thought when France owns a country, they just like force assimilate everyone else. But they thought if the British had control of Palestine and they moved there, then the British would just leave them alone. So the Zionists who had control and the power in this part of the process, they were, they liked the, the British more than the French. Mellow, that's, yeah, that's correct. Most Jews were not Zionists. Yeah, that's another thing, okay? This propagandist, right, the Zionist leader, he just comes out of nowhere and he just all of a sudden becomes the face of an entire religion. He's like the leader of the Zionist group and to, the, to a lot of people they thought, oh, Zionism represents all of Jewish people. So like this guy who just came out of nowhere talking out of his ass saying like they own and deserve that land somehow became the official face of an entire religion. By 1917, the war was shifting in the Allies' favor. And in the Middle East, the British were moving through Sinai towards the borders of historic Palestine. Further north, the Russian Revolution in February 1917 cast doubt on Russia's continued involvement in the war. As Britain and France tried to outmaneuver one another, the British Zionist movement took on increasing political importance. British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour asked Chaim Weizmann to present his demands as a declaration and promised to try and persuade his government to adopt it. The leading Zionists formed a political committee and drafted their demands, and then submitted them to the British government. On the 18th of September 1917, there was a meeting of the British War Cabinet, the Foreign Secretary Arthur... British War Cabinet. Remember, the War Cabinet was invented by Milner, and they did a coup of the government in order to implement it. Their Balfour was absent. The Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montague, who was Jewish, 
strongly disagreed with the declaration. He was opposed to Zionism and said, I deny that Palestine is today associated with the Jews or properly be regarded as a fit place for them to live. Montague thought a French declaration supporting Zionism in June 1917 was anti-Semitic and negotiated changes to the British version as it went through several drafts. A few days later, Secretary of State for War Viscount Milner and the Jewish politician Philip Magnus. The fact that it's in a documentary a like this. A few days later, Secretary it's of sense, State for War you know. Viscount Milner and the Jewish politician Philip Magnus Look, sent a modified version to the cabinet. Even in a documentary by Al Jazeera, they're saying Milner wrote it. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is what actually happened and did some of Montague's changes, including the caveat that, quote, nothing shall be done that might prejudice the rights and political status enjoyed by such Jews who are fully contented with their existing nationality and citizenship. Drafting, especially by Lord Milner, that appeared by September, was closer to the language that would eventually be adopted in November of 1917, namely speaking uh, not about Palestine as, as a whole, uh, but uh, a, some sort of presence in Palestine uh, on behalf of the Jews. Uh, which is quite different. كانت كل كلمة بوعد بالفور إلها معنى. فالفرق إنك تقول the national home يعني قل التعريف الوطن القومي. This is big. So here, I'll I'll give you the the Coles notes here. There was that Montague guy who said even saying Jewish people should go to Palestine is anti-Semitic. That guy, he had an impact on Milner. Milner. And the Milner group really respected the Arabs. Their plan, they wanted to westernize the Arabs. They did not like this whole like plan of making a whole Jewish country, but they needed the Jews for to end the war. So they, they formed kind of a balancing act and what they ended up with. Milner changed the wording to make it like this. The committed Zionists wanted to ensure the declaration was clear that the whole of historic Palestine would be a national homeland exclusively for the Jewish people. The latest draft was sent to Chaim Weizmann, who in turn sent it to the Zionist movement in the United States for their feedback. Uh, there was some consultation you know, during the summer of 1917 uh, with the United States and, and the early drafts that uh, had had the imprint of the Zionist uh, uh, elements in Britain um, would have referred to Palestine uh, in its entirety as being uh, for some sort of Jewish entity. Right. And those elements eventually were modified uh, before the drafting was finalized. Another key part of the terminology that emerged in part of the drafting uh, was in some British redrafting, where instead of for the Jewish people, it was written the Jewish race. Now, eventually this was taken out, but I think it's very revealing that British officials wanted to use this kind of terminology, because after all, this was how they understood the Jews of the world as being a racial group, one that wielded tremendous power and also could be inspired altogether as one unit behind the cause of Zionism supported by Britain and the Allies. It's striking that the existing Arab people in the region were not named at all. This They're part. simply called the, quote, existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. They, they could not even say Arab, or they could not even, they just called them non-Jewish. The non-Jewish part of Palestine and the Jewish part that was going to settle there. So fucking disrespectful. Juive, 
on ne cite même pas le nom des Arabes. Ce sont des non-juifs qui n'ont que des droits civils et religieux. Ils n'ont pas de droits politiques. Aucun droit politique. It sucks. Zionists made this declaration and then when it went to British hands, Milner changed it to make it better for the Arabs. But still, it was freaking awful. They did objectively make it better for the Arabs, but still, it was just the starting point was such a freaking disaster that it led to what is happening even still to this day. By October 1917, the final draft of the Balfour Declaration was ready, awaiting only British Bastards. government final approval. There was a rumor that Germany was about to issue a similar is. declaration Balfour. supporting the rights of the Jews in Palestine. When Balfour heard, he rushed to get his final draft discussed at the cabinet meeting on the 31st of October 1917. So guys, this is the war cabinet. Look at this group. 1917, this is a year before Milner is considered to have full control of the government. So. If you look at this war cabinet, the war cabinet was invented and created by the Milner Group. Half of these people at this table are Cecil Block members. The other half are Milner Group members. So when we think about the centenary of the Balfour Declaration, everyone considers 2nd of November 1917 as the moment of the Declaration itself. But it was actually agreed to by the British cabinet on the 31st of October. And this was a hugely significant meeting. And in the minutes of that meeting, Balfour uh, reiterates the principal reasons for supporting Zionism and highlights its expected propaganda effects uh, amongst Jews around the world, particularly in the United States and in Russia. The so Balfour, pro-Zionist, as you can see. Argument was was put forward most strongly by Lord Balfour at the meeting of October He was 31st. really pushing it. Uh, Meanwhile, and the Milner what group he was argued like, was that you know, trying to this declaration it slightly. would be extremely helpful for the British uh, in solidifying the support of the United States uh, and also in countering uh, propaganda from Germany. The critical thing to remember about British diplomatic pronouncements is that what one individual says does not represent the views of the government as a whole. And you will find many different points of view among British officials in the years 1917, 1918, and right into the early years of the mandate. But the British were very clear that they had not promised statehood <laughs> That's Lloyd George. to the Zionist movement. They had no interest in doing so. The British did not support Jewish nationalism. They did not support Arab nationalism. They supported British imperialism. But this is also the meeting where uh, Lord Curzon, who was a member of the War Cabinet, and disquiet like about the possible effects of supporting Zionism on the Palestinian Arab population and the Palestinian opposition is completely disregarded. Lord Curzon wrote a paper to the Cabinet asking what was, quote, to become of the people of this country. There were over half a million Syrian Arabs. Um so listen to this. Here, he's part of the Cecil Bloc, right? Arthur Balfour, leader of the Cecil Bloc, really pushing the Zionist cause, mostly because they wanted the support of the Jews to win World War I. This guy, also in the Cecil Bloc, strongly opposed it. So here you're seeing two people who are part of the same secret society who are butting heads about something that's very important. And Corzon is definitely right on this. Asking what was, quote, to become of the people of this country. There were over half a million Syrian Arabs, a mixed community with Arab, Hebrew, Canaanite, Greek, Egyptian, and possibly Crusaders blood. They and their forefathers have occupied the country for the best part of 1,500 years. They own the soil. They profess the Mohammedan faith. They will not be content either to be expropriated for Jewish immigrants or to act merely as hewers of wood and drawers of water to the latter. But his yeah. prescient remarks fell on deaf ears. It's Sykes who tells Hein Weizmann at the end of the War Cabinet's meeting Dr. Weizmann, it's a boy, as though they've witnessed the birth of an agreement to create 
a Jewish national home as a baby in the Middle East. And there it is. The final draft of the Balfour Declaration. That the assistant comes with the letter written by the Milner. was 67 words long. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely, Arthur James Balfour. Lord Milner. Well, in terms of international law, it really has very little standing. In international law, you know, treaties between nations have significance, um, uh, but governments often issue policy statements, statements of intention about what they plan to do, uh, and those really don't have any standing as, yeah. uh, as a matter of, of law. Uh, for Britain, this was, uh, I suppose you would say, a statement of its intention as to what it would do if it were to take over Palestine, which, of course, it, it uh, had not yet done uh, as of November 1917. Two years after the declaration, a church leader in Jerusalem wrote to British Prime Minister Isn't that Lord crazy? George about Jews in Palestine trying to control holy sites. Lloyd George's office had said that Chaim Weizmann didn't want to do anything affecting the rights of Arabs. It said he simply wanted to be involved in a council to help provide refuge to Jews fleeing Russia and Eastern Europe. This exchange suggested that Britain felt it had not promised a Jewish state, but simply a place for them to live alongside Arabs. When the League of Nations set out the British mandate in Palestine in 1923, it made Britain responsible for implementing the Balfour Declaration. Yeah. As a result, Jewish immigration to Palestine increased, as did Arab opposition to it expressed in a series of Palestinian protests against Britain in the 1920s. They understood the people of Palestine to be Muslims and Christians, but did not imagine that they would constitute a national community that would seek national independence. And after the war, very quickly when it becomes clear that Palestinian Arab nationalists are mobilizing against Zionism, the British government are quick to see a major problem. The Balfour Declaration had put in train a series of events that began to signal its deep flaws. Arab dissent built to the three-year revolt between 1936 and 1939. It was a nationalist uprising against the British administration, demanding Arab independence and the end of Jewish immigration. It was in the Peel Commission of 1937 that the British first recognized that instead of balancing communities, they had set in motion a rivalry between incompatible national movements, Jewish and Palestinian Arab. And it was at that point that they tried to solve the problem by dividing Palestine into two states, Arab and Jewish, through a partition plan. And I think there you have the first recognition or admission from British officials of the failure of the Balfour Declaration. Yeah. In May 1939, the British government published a policy document on Palestine called a white paper. It abandoned the partitioning of Palestine into two states and called instead for an independent Palestine in which Arabs and Jews would share government. It limited Jewish immigration to 75,000 for five years and said that the Arab majority should determine future immigration levels. It also said that Balfour had not meant to create a Jewish state at the expense of the Arabs, any more than the Makman Hussein correspondence 24 years before had promised an Arab state to Sharif Hussein of Mecca. And the crazy thing about this story is this letter that is so important and has caused so much suffering in our world, it had no 
power, really. It would be like if AOC sent a letter to Nancy Pelosi, like, who fucking cares? It's not a law, it's not an international agreement. It's, and that's the other funny thing. So Balfour Declaration is the British government sending a letter to Lord Rothschild, who does not even, he's not even a Zionist and does not even want Jews to go to Palestine. So right away, it's like, what the who fucking cares about this letter? It doesn't mean anything. Um, but then the Peel Commission happened in 23, in which the League of Nations said, you have to create a policy that is in line with the Balfour Declaration. So this letter that was a nothing burger ended up being like the skeleton of the fucked up situation we have now, right? And not even now, but that's been fucked up for since it started. But here's the other important note. The Milner Group actually did not, they were not part of that process at all, right? Here's an important part of actually this whole presentation. It is not one secretive group that controls everything in the world. That's not how it works. And definitely at this point in history, that's not how it worked, right? And you're getting a, a portion of it. There was a Cecil Block who did a little bit of work. The Milner Group influenced them. They ended up altering the Balfour Declaration. And then Milner Group was hands off. That was it. They, all they did was the Balfour Declaration, that little edit that Milner did. That's all they did. But the Zionists, which were another secret group of wealthy, influential people, they took the reins and they took that Balfour Declaration and they ran with it trying to get more and more power because in their mind, they wanted the whole goddamn land for themselves. So the Milner group did not create the Israel that we know today, although they did accidentally. By doing that letter, they tried making it better for the Arabs. They didn't do it well enough. It was still a goddamn disaster. And then the Zionists ran with it to create um, ethnic cleansing and a, a terrible part of our world today.